I'm recording this video at the beginning of December and it should be valid for most of December but for one thing and that is looking southwest where we are at the moment you can see those two bright objects there uh, not the planes which are moving of course but uh, you can't miss those two Jupiter and Saturn Jupiter is the lower one and it's the brighter Saturn above it over the course of this month Jupiter will be moving closer towards Saturn and on the 21st the two will be so close together you, you probably won't be able to tell them apart with the naked eye. Uh, very close indeed, as close as they have been since the year 1623. And this is apparently known as a great conjunction, a term which I'd never heard before but the papers seem to be full of it these days. And there's a plane just about to try and get into the act there with quite a few of them around. I'm not far from Heathrow Airport. This is on the flight path into Heathrow overlooking the Thames Valley. So there'll be a few of those around. So this is to show you what constellations you can find in the night sky uh, in uh, this time of year in December. And if I pan up, you can see a feature which has been with us throughout the summer and that is the constellation of Aquila and the bright star there in the middle with two on, with one on either side is the star Altair and if I move further up from there it's a bit of cloud trying to get into the act now over to the right we've got the bright star Vega which again has been with us throughout the summer and in fact in the middle of summer it's more or less overhead and right at the top of the field of view there we've got the star Deneb these three between them call, are called the Summer Triangle and of course I know it's winter now but nevertheless they will be around well into, into January if you look early enough in the evening. Uh, later in the evening they will still be around and, and setting. Now I'm going to move back over towards the south and I'm going to pan up a bit and here we have a great feature of the autumn and early winter skies, which is the constellation of Pegasus. The area there is called the Square of Pegasus, and it's not quite a square, it's actually quite large, and the stars aren't all that bright. They're about as bright as the stars of the plough, if you know that. But nevertheless, it's quite a prominent feature of the late autumn and early winter sky and it's very useful in most years for pointing out features of the sky for example if we pan down it points to the constellation of Cetus the water monster and if we go over to the left of it we have the stars of Pisces and the constellation of Aries but at the moment of course we also have the planet Mars and that's that really bright object there which has been with us throughout the summer but now it's starting to fade it is not nearly as bright as it was about a couple of months ago it was at its closest two months ago on October the 6th when it was really very bright but even so it is a particularly bright object and one of those things you just can't miss in the sky and you'll probably notice its slight reddish colour as well. It's not as bright red as, well there's a plane going over at the moment and its its lights really are red. It's not as bright as that but nevertheless it's a distinctly orangey colour, sort of salmon pink and you can't really mistake it for any other planet compared with Jupiter which is much more white in colour. It's, it's very noticeable if you look at the two one after the other you will see the difference straight away. I mentioned the constellation of Aries which is in the middle there now and that is the constellation of Ram the Ram and of course it's one of those zodiacal constellations not a particularly bright one those three stars that are there are the most obvious feature of it there are another few stars around and um, it is one of the features of a very ancient constellation when the 
decide, thought that um, when people decided that maybe the stars had some influence on their lives, they tried to divide the stars up into 12 equal constellations. Well, it doesn't really work because there are whole patches of the sky like over to the lower right there, which is Pisces, where there's virtually no bright stars in a better sky than we have got tonight in a nice dark country sky. No doubt something would be visible, but uh, um, not obvious in today's skies. There's quite a few planes going around at the moment, as you can see. Moving a bit further to the left of that, going towards the north, you can see another zodiacal constellation. Uh, trying to just being hidden a bit by the clouds but there's a most pr obvious feature of that and that is the seven sisters or Pleiades star cluster which you can see twinkling away there a very f obvious feature of the of late autumn and indeed the winter skies and the enjoyable thing is to count the number of the Pleiades which on the screen there you can probably count uh, probably six seven maybe even more but with the naked eye not quite so easy have a look and if you want a real treat, take a look through binoculars and you'll see many more. Below that is the bright star Aldebaran and there's another cluster there, uh, not such an obvious one. It is the Hyades star cluster and it forms a sort of V-shape on its side at the moment because this is over in the east and the stars are rising at the moment and as they get higher in the sky they will uh, form more of an obvious v it's on its side now, but um, that, that's the constellation of Taurus, and that forms the head of the bull. Later on in the evening, in that direction, we will see the constellation of Orion rising below it. It's starting to come up now, but there's just too much cloud in the way, and so um, the top stars are around, but uh, not, so, not, not really obvious at the moment. If I pan up from here, in the middle there, is a constellation of Perseus and that's another feature of winter skies which will be, be with us throughout the winter and into the spring. It's always actually up in the sky but uh, sometimes during the summer it's very low in the sky so it's starting to come into its own now. And above that a constellation which many people will recognise, the W shape of Cassiopeia. Now, if I go over to the right of it now and I've pointed out the square of Pegasus which is starting to get a bit hidden by cloud it's quite high up in the sky so I'm having to squat down to look through the viewfinder so there's a the square of Pegasus and there's a line of stars in between the t in between um, Pegasus and Perseus which is the constellation of Andromeda and right in the middle at the moment is the Andromeda galaxy I'll just brighten up the field of view a bit uh, by changing the shutter speed so that maybe the Andromeda galaxy will be more obvious there it is and you can see that even from the city using binoculars and I've shown you in November how to find that so I won't do it again but it's well worth looking for. Okay now we're going to go down towards the horizon and here we have another very well-known feature of the winter skies this is the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer. And the bright star there, Capella, one of the brightest in the sky, it will be overhead in the, later in the winter and later in the evening. And it more or less changes place with Vega, which is another bright star which we've looked at already. And Capella will be pretty well overhead in the, in the middle of winter and in, in, in January time uh, later in the evening. And that sort of pentagon there is the constellation of Auriga. Moving now there, down to the, to the north, a bit of wind noise on the mic, sorry about that, we find the constellation of the Plough. It's the most obvious at this time of year because it's close to the horizon. The I call it the Plough, it's actually the 
asterism of the plough. The constellation is called Ursa Major, the Great Bear, and that forms the pattern of the bear itself. The, um, the French call it the casserole, which is uh, the saucepan, really, and the Americans call it the Big Dipper, and we call it the plough, take your choice. But it's as a main feature of the skies at this time of year, and it's easy to spot. Funny enough, it looks very big now in the sky, but when you see it high in the sky in summer, it looks much smaller, and this is uh, an, an optical illusion. It changed, it, there's no atmospheric magnification, as some people think. The, the sun and moon do the same when you see the moon low on the horizon. It looks really huge, but it's, it's purely an optical illusion compared because you've got something to compare it with, the trees and houses and so on that you're looking at, and you know that they're big, and so it's beyond those, and it, so it must be really big. But if you see it high in the sky, it looks small. Measure the size using a, a ruler at arm's length or something like that, and you'll find that it's exactly the same size, no matter where it is in the sky. Moving up from the constellation of Ursa Major, the, the plough, you take follow the two stars at the right-hand side and follow them upwards, and you come to the Pole Star. And here it is at the, at the end of the tail of the... Lesser bear, the Ursa Minor, and Polaris, the pole star, it's always in the same position in the sky. So once you've found it from your garden or wherever, it will never move. It's the same at the winter and the summer, always exactly, pretty well exactly the same position. Now, I, I said the tail of the, the bear, and the, the greater bear is a tail. Bears don't, as a rule, have significant tails, not nothing, nothing like as long as they are apparently in the sky here but uh, the the reason that they've got them now is that when they were when these two poor animals were flung up into the sky uh, to become constellations they were grabbed by the tail and flung up and their tails extended that's the story believe it or not now if i move around to the left yet further we have the constellation of draco which is winding itself around the pole the dragon and in the middle there is the head of the dragon. And then we're back to the constellation, uh, to the star Vega there, which I showed you earlier on, in the constellation of Lyra. So you've done a full tour of the sky. But one thing I do want to mention going back, now I'm going to go whizzing back over to the constellation of Auriga here. In that part of the sky, will be rising over in the over in the east and northeast will be rising the stars of Gemini I think they would be visible now if the sky were totally clear in that direction it's a bit bit too hazy uh, might be one of the stars down at the bottom there I can't tell and this is the source of the great meteor shower in the middle of December around December the 14th is the time when it's at, at its maximum the Geminid meteors and those are very prominent, one of the best meteor showers of the year. Meteors, also known as shooting stars. Everyone will say they'll be raining down on us, so the press will be saying the skies will be alight with them. No, that's a bit of an exaggeration. They do like to make more of it than is the reality. And of course, it's astronomers who get the blame for saying that it's going to be a spectacular shower. But no, actually, the, you may be lucky if you spend 10 minutes outside, you may see two or three. You may see none at all because they come in bursts. Uh, well, not so much. They come at random, actually, not in bursts. Um, but it seems as if they do because because we're very bad at as randomness. We, we always think that you have a, a randomness is a sort of even scatter of things. No, it's not. You can get bursts of them, um, two or three in a row, and then you might get a long gap with nothing, and then they might be evening to even this space. There is no predicting when one will appear. So you just have to go out for an hour or so, looking up into the sky, any time after, uh, as soon as it gets dark, but maybe later in the evening would be better when the source of the meteors, Gemini, is higher up in the sky, but any, any time will do. When it's higher in the sky, it means you can see meteors above and below the place where they radiate from. So Gemini down there over in the east is where they tend to radiate from. And you'll find that the constellation of Gemini is very obvious because there are two stars of roughly equal brightness, not very close together, but, uh, um, but nevertheless quite, quite prominent. And 
they form what's known as the heavenly twins. So that's the constellation of Gemini, not risen yet, but this is about six in the evening. I think that um, star up there is the star, the, the one right down near the horizon, is a star caster, which is one of the two, and Pollux, which is the other one, is still to rise from this time of the evening, which is about six o'clock in the evening, by about seven or eight, then you'll see the two stars. So, have a good night's observing, and don't get too cold.